Have you ever heard of the 12 Factor app? That's a document created more than 20 years ago that described the best practices that must be followed in modern web applications. It was written by some of the best developers and it's widely respected in the industry. The 12 Factor app recommendations are great and should be followed by dApps. However, this is not enough for dApps. Dapps have also a unique set of challenges because of the blockchain environment. In this video, I will describe you a set of best practices that should be followed by dApps and smart contract developers. A sort of 12-factor app, but for dApps. If you are learning how to design a dApp, these ideas will give you some solid principles to follow. These principles come from my two years experience building Ethereum dApps and Solidity smart contract, as well as many discussions with my students on Eat the Blocks Pro. Before we continue, I'd like to quickly tell you about Eat the Blocks Pro, my screencast for Ethereum and Solidity smart contract developers. Every week, I release a new video on Ethereum or Solidity development. When you become a member, on top of getting access to all the exclusive videos, you also get access to a Telegram group where me and other students can provide you live help when you need it. If you have any question or remark about the design principle that I'm going to explain you in this video, don't hesitate to ask your question in a comment and I will answer you. All right, so let's get started with the principle number one. You should not take control of your user private keys. So the whole point of the blockchain security is to not have any centralized vulnerability. If you store the private keys of your user to sign transactions on their behalf, this creates a honeypot for hacker and annihilate the security guarantees of the blockchain for your users. So you should absolutely not do this. Principle number two, you should not sign transaction on behalf of your users from a central server. In order to minimize gas cost and improve usability, it can be tempting to move the signing of Ethereum transactions from user browsers to a central server. In this case, the application authenticates user with a traditional username password mechanism and some Ethereum transaction on behalf of users on a central server using a private key control by the application. There are two problems with this. First, you need to trust that the application will not maliciously sign transactions that were not approved by the user. And second, the private key control by the application creates a honeypot for hackers. They only need to hack one server to hack all users. There is an exception to this rule if your users sign messages with their private keys and the server only acts as a proxy who broadcasts transactions with the signed messages of users, there isn't much at risk on the server. At worst, hackers can stop the broadcasting of transactions to the blockchain, but they cannot modify the signature of users and falsify their intent. Principle number three, you should put all the critical data and code on the blockchain. Because storing and manipulating data on the blockchain is expensive, you don't want to put all your data on a smart contract. Actually, most apps only put a small fraction of the data on the blockchain. However, even if you don't put everything on the blockchain, you still need to make sure that both the critical code and the data are indeed on chain. It's up to you to know what is critical or not for your application, but usually everything related to the economy or the governance of your dApp is critical. On the contrary, files, user settings, and metadata have less importance. Principle number four, you should always run security tools on your smart contract. Security is a really big deal when developing smart contracts. They can manipulate real money and they are immutable, which means they cannot be updated. So if a hacker finds a bug in your code, he or she could drain your smart contract of all its funds. Did someone say DAO? Security tools like Mitril can catch the low-hanging fruits for you. Still, once your project reaches a certain scale, you should hire a professional team to conduct a full audit of your code. Principle number five, you should deploy your dApp on a public testnet before the mainnet. Public testnet networks like Robston or Covran allows dApp developers to test their dApp in a safe box using fake ether without any real-world consequences. Compared to a local development environment, it is closer to production, which is the mainnet. It is quite common to find bugs on a testnet that did not happen on your local development environment. Testing your dApp on a public testnet does not guarantee you that your dApp won't have bugs on mainnet, but at least your users won't accuse you of having skipped the public testnet phase. Principle number six, you should use Ethereum addresses to identify your users. In dApps, like in most applications, you will probably need to identify your users to enforce access control. On most web applications, users are identified using either a username or email. 
However, in the case of dApps, we want to avoid dealing with data generated from outside the blockchain. Ethereum addresses are 160 bit pieces of data that identify the standards of transaction. Users can generate as many addresses as they want using their wallet. Addresses are often represented with their hexadecimal form. They can not only be used for signing transactions, but also just for signing messages, which can be verified outside the blockchain. When your smart contract receives a transaction, it guarantees you that the value of MSG sender will be the signer of the transaction. You should use this to implement access control. You can still associate an Ethereum address to an off-chain generated user ID on a central server, but you should not use this user ID to do any critical computation. It should just be used for convenience. Principle number seven, you should explain the update mechanism of your smart contract. The code of a smart contract is immutable. However, developers often need to update the code of the application to fix bugs and add new features. So how can they do this with a smart contract? The solution to this is to make your contract updatable. There are different solutions to this, but the cleanest way to do it is to use the proxy pattern with two smart contracts, a proxy smart contract and an implementation smart contract. Users send their transaction to the proxy smart contract, which itself forwards everything to the implementation smart contract. This is the smart contract that implements the logic for manipulating data. When you need to update your smart contract logic, you will first deploy your new implementation smart contract and then call a function on a proxy contract that updates the address of the implementation smart contract. Future calls to the proxy contract will forward to the new implementation smart contract and ignore the old implementation contract. The problem with the above pattern is that it breaks the promise of immutability of code on a blockchain. In order to mitigate this, you can implement a governance system to establish clear rules on who or what can trigger a smart contract update on a proxy smart contract. In any case, you should be very explicit about this mechanism. Don't fool your user into thinking that your smart contract code will never change even though you put in place an update mechanism. Principle number eight, you should explain how the external data is collected. Oftentimes, dApps need to use data that is external to the blockchain stock prices, results from external APIs, etc, etc. This poses a problem because the blockchain does not know how to fetch data from the outside world. The solution to this is to feed a smart contract with outside data. Once the data is inside the smart contract, it can be used inside the blockchain. That is what we call the Oracle pattern. However, the Oracle pattern poses a problem because a hacker could hack the external entity that feeds data to the blockchain to change the result of a computation on the blockchain. Some companies such as Oracleize try to solve this problem by having several external entities feeding the same data to an Oracle smart contract. Only data with enough quote unquote votes are deemed safe for use by other smart contracts. In any case, whether you are using a basic Oracle pattern or the Oracleized system, the mechanism needs to be disclosed clearly to users so that they understand clearly what can influence the computation of the smart contract and what are the security risks of your dApp. Principle number nine, you should verify your smart contract on Etherscan. The idea of a dApp is to promise your users that the code that will run will be the code of a smart contract. The code of a smart contract is always public and anybody can read it to make sure that they agree with what is inside. Mm -hmm. However, when users interact with a smart contract, all they have at their disposal is an Ethereum address and a vague promise that the code of this address is what the dApp developers claim it to be. Etherscan has a feature to verify that a smart contract has the source code it claims to have. Dapp developers can submit their smart contract to Etherscan after they deploy it to the blockchain. Etherscan using some internal tools to verify that the claim is true and display the result publicly on their website for other users to see. That is not a foolproof solution because Etherscan itself could be hacked or become malicious, but it's still better than nothing. Principle number 10. You should show feedback to users while a transaction is mining. In a traditional web application, after a user sends a request to the server, a loading screen usually shows up if the request takes too long or if it is required to change something in a database. This feedback helps the user to know that everything is okay and he or she should just keep waiting. With dApps, loading times are not only worse but also have a different nature. First, on Ethereum, a transaction takes about 15 seconds to be mined or added to the blockchain if you want. 
And second, contrary to a centralized database, on Ethereum there is no finality after a data change. Which means we cannot say now the blockchain has acknowledged my transaction forever. Blockchain is vulnerable to what we call block reorganizations, which means you are never sure that the chain that added your transaction will be the chain that quote unquote win in the long run. Maybe that another part of the network was mining faster than on your part of the network and your transaction will be discarded by the alternative chain. In reality, these block reorganizations happen really rarely and when they do, they only happen for the latest one or two blocks. That means that you need to wait a few blocks to be sure that your transactions won't be cancelled. And the more blocks you wait, the more certain you, you will be that there won't be any adverse block reorganization that will cancel your transaction. So what does this mean in terms of UI? You need two kinds of UI confirmations. First, after you send a transaction, you need to show to the user that the transaction was sent. Then, after the first few confirmations, you need to show the user that there was an extra confirmation. After each confirmation, you should show a link to Etherscan for the transaction. This makes the user feel safe that the transaction has been sent. So now you have some really solid principle in mind when designing your dApp. So where do you go from there? Well, it's time to go build some dApps and spot contract and apply these principles. So go create an account on Etherblocks Pro, my video screencast for Ethereum developer. You can start by just creating a free account and you will access the source code for all my video tutorials. If you have any question about the principle discussed in this video, please leave a comment and me and other will answer your comment. Thanks for watching and see you for my next video.